I'm Duncan McLeod, and this is TC Daily, the technology show brought to you by Tech Central. If you haven't subscribed yet, check us out on YouTube at youtube.com slash techcentral. Hit the subscribe button, hit the bell icon, and never miss an update. You can also get all the latest technology news, interviews, and views on techcentral.ca.za. Subscribe to our newsletter there. You'll also get access to TC Daily and all the other tech shows and content that we produce. Now, um, I said a couple of days ago when we started this show that uh, we're going to be interesting, interviewing interesting people in the tech sector in South Africa. And I have a very interesting person to talk to in the chair opposite me now, Andy Higgins. Uh, Andy, is it fair to call you a veteran of e-commerce in South Africa? Or, uh, I don't know. I feel it's, we're still on sort of day one with e-commerce in South Africa. So that feels a little bit too soon to call. But premature. Yes. But you've, so. you, you've been around the block a few times, if I can put it that way. You've, um, you were, of course, the, everyone knows you're the founder of Bid or Buy, uh, one of the early e-commerce ventures in South Africa, which I think you founded in, in the height of the dot-com boom, didn't you? That's right. 1999. Yep. Interesting time to start a business. <laughs> Yes, no, I was a young 23-year-old then. I didn't know too much, so I didn't have much to lose either. So, yeah. But, yeah. but of course, yeah, soon after that, the crash happened, and then, and then I guess it got a lot more yeah. difficult after that. Well, you, you've got a new um, uh, venture, which we're going to be talking about today, uh, quite an interesting new de- development in, in your career and, and, and what you're doing in the e-commerce space in South Africa. But let's, let's go back and have a look at uh, Bid or Buy and, and some of the history. Uh, I know there's a lot of ground to cover, and we're not going to get through it all in, in this particular episode of the show, but um, I, I know that um, you've, you've had your ups and downs over the years. Uh, you founded Bid or Buy back in 1999. You said as a 23-year-old? Yes. Um, what possessed you to start a dot com? Well, it was I, I was actually in the UK at the time, mm-hmm. and um, well, actually prior to that, I'd been in the US. I was working on super yachts in the US, and I tried to get a job in the US, and I didn't have the the right work permit. So okay. I, I was able to work in the UK. So I found myself there, and I worked for an early stage startup company there um, in 1998 called QXL. Um, which eventually went on to list on the London Stock Exchange and be valued at, you know, in the billions of dollars. As everything did back then, yeah. Yes, <laughs> of course, crash soon after that. And that's sort of where I sort of um, got to know, it was an online auction site, and I got to learn how to, and how I assisted from a technical point of view to launch across a number of countries in Europe. Mm. But I kind of, I was homesick. I wanted to come back to South Africa, and that was the one thing I knew how to do. And I was excited about the internet and what it could offer. So that's kind of all I knew. I was very naive at the time, but... Um, Decided to, well, well, I was also very fortunate to, to, to make contact with some initial investors then who offered to put up some cash to, to start what was, became Bid or Buy, although they said I was thinking too small with South Africa and they said we needed to go more global because mm-hmm. eBay was dominating North America, QXL was, was in Europe. We forget how, uh, back then how big online auction sites were. I mean, Absolutely, eBay was yeah. the big king of, of uh, e-commerce at the time. Absolutely. Back then, they only offered auctions. Uh, yeah. Now, more than uh, m- most, pro- most items get sold in a fixed price format, but back then it was only auctions. And I think uh, eBay had just listed on, on the NASDAQ and they were booming. And so our dream back then was to conquer other parts of the world, um, Asia mm-hmm. and even other parts of Europe. So within a period of a few months, we actually had raised uh, $12 million back then as a, you know, as a young I was 24 uh, shortly yeah. after that. Um, it was, yeah, it was, it was quite a wild ride. Worldwind stuff, yeah. And we had either launched or were about to launch within a few months in 12 countries around the world. Uh, these online auction sites in, in multiple languages. One in one in Hebrew and for Israel, and it's where the you know you read from right to left. It was it was quite challenging. So, so you started the business here in South Africa, and then your investor said, "No, we've got to go global with this exactly. immediately." Yes. Uh, so they were like, "Well, South Africa is probably not the best place to be." And I, I remember they said, "Well, where do you think we should be?" I, I mean, I hadn't travelled a whole lot. I'd been in the US and, and in the UK basically, uh, and I, I remember at, at the time uh, the Olympic Games was coming up in Sydney, so. I thought well, I was like, because Australia was one of the countries on the on the roadmap. Right. So I said, okay, what about Australia? And they were like, sure, that sounds good. I was, I, was, I thought like, well, what about Perth? You know, that's kind of close to South Africa. They're like, no, no, Sydney. Okay, yes, yeah, Sydney. That, that's good. Let's, <laughs> let's, so I arrived in Sydney, never been there before, and um, prepared and we, we launched these sites. Yeah. And I actually ended up actually dragging with me a whole lot of South Africans because obviously I didn't know anyone right. there. Right. So, um, yeah, some university mates ended up joining me there. And we set up shop, and uh, it was challenging to say the least. I mean, at the same within the same month, eBay launched, Yahoo Auctions launched. There was a lot of competition, so we had lots of early lessons and challenges. But 
yeah, like I said, it was quite a wild ride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just uh, actually looking at these old wide magazines we have on our bookshelf here in the in the studio, and I'm sure there's so many tales of companies like yours at the time that were chasing chasing the gold rush of the dot com. It was. I think era. maybe so. You read about like mm. the web vans and those that they were spending. I mean, we were spending a lot of money. Make mm. no mistake, but we also weren't making any money at the time. But we weren't super extravagant, like flying, you know, first class around the world right. and sipping champagne. So we were a bit more frugal from that point of view. But the fact that we weren't charging for our service meant that there were definitely uh, <laughs> challenges coming ahead when, you know, when the, when the markets turned. Yeah, know. yeah. And they, they crashed in 2000. Well, when did the, if the peak was peak, March 2000, I think. 2000, uh, yes, that's correct. And then it March fell 2000. for about 18 months. Yes. Uh, down and down and down and down. It's, it's interesting to look at it after the fact when you look at the graphs because at the, um, you think of it as this big crash, but it wasn't, it wasn't something that just like happened mm. all at once. It was actually quite gradual, as I remember. Over, I mean, yes, sure, it was dropping, but at the time, you, you don't know what's coming. So, no. so only when you look at it... You don't realise you were actually looking exactly, over the edge of a exactly, cliff at the time. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, fascinating stuff. So, so you'd taken this business global, um, but then, then capital was drying up around the world. What happened then? Yeah, so, so we were about to raise $50 million uh, capital, just, just, and, and then we were unable to do so. Mm-hmm. Um, so what happened was uh, one of our competitors in India, which was the, actually the second market we went into, um, they had managed to raise capital just before the crash happened. And so and, and we had had basically the short of it is we had good tech at the time. Uh, we had built our own tech and their tech was falling over as it was trying to um, uh, scale. So what we ended up doing, well, we say we merged with them. I think they would say they acquired us, which is oh. probably more accurate. Okay. <laughs> um, and so we became uh, in India, um, we we became a company called Bazi.com, which actually in 2004 got bought by eBay and it became eBay India. Mm-hmm. Um, we ended up closing, essentially closing down all our sites, uh, other sites around the world that weren't, didn't have traction, mm-hmm. with the exception of South Africa. So uh, I was living, I lived in Sydney for two years and then ended up coming back to South Africa. We were employed hundreds of people um, around the world in the company and we had to do all the retrenchments and it was quite a difficult time. We, at, at our lowest point, we, we actually, so I came back to South Africa. We went down to myself and one other person. Sure. And that one other person actually happens to be still working with, with us, which is amazing. Who is that? It's Samantha Naidu. She's um, started in customer service and now she runs the category team at, at Bidobai. And, but so that, that, that sort of 2002 to 2005, I actually call the dark ages of the internet in mm. South Africa because it was, you know, people forget, like back then there was no ADSL even, it was dial-up, you had to pay per minute to be online, isn't that crazy? If you think today, well, <laughs> you want to pay per minute to be online, like what the heck? So, um, the, so it was a very um, dark time and then I did what uh, apparently a lot of people do, I went and studied, uh, I went and did an MBA, I thought, okay, let's see how you're supposed to do this, you know, <laughs> so but it was part-time. So that was took me up to 2008, and I think that's when things started to start changing a bit um, from then on, where um, you know internet became a bit more mainstream, ADSL you know became a bit had had a lot more traction. Yeah. And I remember sitting in front of my computer one day, just looking at the the log files, the web server log files, as as, as geeks sometimes do. Sure. And I remember seeing these search um, t- terms coming from Google, where it would be. I just saw. Um, you know, in the log files, what people were searching for, and because there wasn't a whole lot of content out there, there weren't a lot of, wasn't a lot of competition. We would rank high on Google. So now I have this sort of, I guess, love hate relationship with Google because, you know, back then we were getting all this free organic traffic from Google, and I think mm. that's what actually turned things around and got us on a track where we actually became profitable, although on a small scale back then. And we ended up getting, um, so so the site st- started to started to get some traction. We got uh, one of the big New York hedge funds, or they still around Tiger Global. Oh, yes. They showed some interest. I think we were the first African investment in, uh, company that they invested in. They, um, they invested in Take a Lot at one point. They didn't did they? too. Mm. Yes, mm. I actually co I had to, got the opportunity to co invest and to Take a Lot with them as well because okay. I was involved in the early stages of Take a Lot. Um, just oh, on, I didn't know that. One. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, but. Um, they, yeah, then it was more later on yeah, that, that they disinvested from, I think, all the African investments yes. and then I exited as well. I think it was around 2017, if I remember correctly now. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, and um, so, so, so that evolved. I, but I actually left, well, I've, I've been involved pretty much from the beginning, um, but I, I left the company in an operational role in 2010. I went traveling. So mm-hmm. I met my wife. We went traveling. We got, I got married and I came back. To South Africa. So who was running Bid or Buy through this period? Um, so yes. So um, while I was there, w- when Tiger Global invested, one of the, the, in fact, the only main requirement for them to make the investment was that we hire a CFO. Okay. Because for them, it was very important that we have someone, you know, watch the numbers. Exactly. Mm-hmm. 
So I hired uh, so was a, a gentleman by the name of Yaku Yonka. He was a, you know, he is a chartered accountant and he came in and he added, I guess, uh, made us grow up a bit, added lots of controls and that sort of thing. And that was 2008 when he joined in. So he actually took over running the business okay. from 2010, I think up until 2018, actually. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so, 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 so sort of in safe hands there. Um, but of course, what happened during that time, Take a Lot obviously was start starting to, to, to grow and mm -hmm. um, become obviously the dominant marketplace in the country. And I yeah. think it's fair to say, uh, I think my team doesn't really like me saying this, but obviously we, we, we dropped the ball at Burubai and kind of st really stagnated as a business. We had this early start and advantage, but mm -hmm. we didn't keep up with the evolving uh, e-commerce trends. And so it's kind of um, stagnated over the time. And I think that, yeah, so it kind of takes us to, to today mm -hmm. um, th to a large extent. Yeah. Um, but before, we, before you get to the announcement uh, that you're making uh, about the creation of this new business, uh, there's another company that you've been involved with for some years called, called U Africa. Yes. Uh, what's the background to you, Africa? So, um, but I actually invested in a company called Jump Shopping, which is a price comparison site. So to, mm. to price check, if you may know, they were actually prior to price check as well. At some point, so I talk about this love hate relationship with Google. At some, those sites tend to be very dependent on traffic, organic traffic from Google. And at some point, um, Google just decided to sh sh stop showing love yeah. and sending traffic. Um, after but about made investment, but we still had a, a small but a very competent team there. So when I came back from my travels, um, you know, I'm, I'm more of the startup type guy, like this, like the challenges of early stage mm -hmm. business generally. Um, so I offered to buy this business, and basically what happened there is we 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 wanted to actually build an e-commerce software as a platform um, for for e-commerce stores. But as we learnt and uh, and sort of got more into it we realized that a company called Shopify had actually built mm. pretty much what we wanted. So we ended up partnering with them instead. And we essentially helped them uh, launch Shopify into a number of African countries. And during that journey, we learned that the biggest challenge we found that merchants were facing was actually on the logistics of e-commerce. So I'd also obviously been involved in the marketplace, I'd been involved in Take A Lot. I was also involved with um, starting PayFast with Jonathan Smith. So I had a very good understanding of the payments, online payment side as well. I realized that this missing piece was the logistics side, and that's actually the, it's the least sexy part of this whole thing. But in my opinion now, knowing what I know now, it's the most important part to get right, actually, if you want to offer a, 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 a good e-commerce offering. So UAfrica, um, with the team we had there, evolved into providing e-commerce tools for online merchants. Um, predominantly, uh, one way, we, we an ag people call us an aggregator of, of, of logistics solutions. So mm -hmm. we integrate with uh, e-commerce platforms on the one hand and with courier companies on the other. So you can, if you go into the platform, it's kind of like a HIPPO is for insurance. We mm -hmm. offer courier companies where you can go and get multiple quotes from multiple couriers on a per shipment basis. So per order that comes in, comes in, we fetch the quotes from multiple couriers and you can choose which courier you want to ship with based on what you're shipping and where you're shipping to. And... Um, we manage the the whole process on behalf of the sellers for the buyers, all the tracking, the submission of the of, of the shipping labels and the tracking and all of that tracking updates. Okay, okay. So that's U Africa. That was sort of my second you know, after Bit or Buy. Right. Although I did remain um, as a non exec director at Bit or Buy during this time as well. Okay. So you've been on the Bit or Buy board right through. Yes. Okay. Okay. Now you're merging these two businesses. You're creating a new company called. Bob Group. Bob Group, interesting yes. name. Why so Bob Group? It actually comes from the short of Bid or Buy. So often people ah. will refer to us as Bid or Buy. Mm -hmm. And we also introduced at Bid or Buy a payment method, which we called Bob Pay, which was the way you could, you could pay on the marketplace itself. And that kind of stuck and we liked that. Um, except now we're going to expand on that and offer it outside of the marketplace as well. So we call it Bob Pay version 2. And we have some other ideas around the, the, the using the, the, the Bob as to, to, to prefix the services that we want to offer. Okay. Yeah. So you're merging Bit of Buy and U Africa into a new business that's going to offer a, a, a what are you going to offer to the market? So, so we're going to offer predominantly a online marketplace as we have in the past with some differences to our competitors, which I can expand on if you'd like. Secondly, we're going to offer online payments. So we're going to make it easy for our merchants to accept payments through the marketplace and on their own websites. And thirdly, we're going to offer, offer logistic solutions again on the marketplace as well as for merchants on their own website. So that's one of the biggest points of differentiation is that we see our customer predominantly as the seller or the merchant. 
and we are um, our, our mission is to empower them to provide excellent service to their customers. And to some extent, we don't particularly mind whether transactions take place on the marketplace or on their own websites or other channels for that matter, because we want to be uh, provide them with all those tools that they need um, wherever that transaction takes place. Okay. So who, what's the target market here specifically? So I'd say our, predominantly our target market would be SMEs mm -hmm. in South Africa. I mean, obviously we welcome all, even larger companies and all that as well. But we want to we want to um, really empower the S SMEs to be able to sell online mm -hmm. um, through whichever channel um, they choose to, whichever channel their buyers choose to purchase from them. Okay. Uh, I suppose it's, it's quite difficult for SMEs. I mean, you, you've got a situation in South Africa now where you're getting some multiple very large marketplaces. And I want to talk to you a bit about how the e-commerce space is developing in South Africa mm -hmm. and is going to develop over the next couple of years. But I suppose it's quite difficult for an SME that doesn't have a logistics fulfillment arm to, exactly. be able to, to do all these things. So you can just plug all this together and... And, and hopefully offer them a solution that allows an SMME to compete with a big corporate take a lot type. That's exactly venture. that's exactly it. And um, I mean, most of these these small companies they don't have the technical ability. And first and, first and foremost, we actually see ourselves as a tech company. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's partly my roots coming from my engineering background. But we really, well, we love the tech. Is to 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 use tech to make things um, more efficient and to empower people to be able to. Using using technology, yeah. So yeah, so a lot of them don't have those capabilities, and so we we, we, we intend to provide them with those capabilities. Okay. And bid or buy the marketplace, does it stay or? So it will stay. Yeah. Um, it's uh, we intend to rebrand it early next year. Is our intention. Um, we one of our other points of differentiation, of course, is that we do offer the auctions. Although that we we do think that that will become less prevalent as we move forward. Um, but still very important for things like collectibles and coins, notes, stamps, mm -hmm. you know, antiques, that sort of thing where the variable pricing model is a good mechanism. Um, so, so, so it will stay, but probably not exactly in its current form and not as prominently as right. it is currently. What sort of percentage of bit of buy sales are through auctions? So now it is, that's a good question. I should know the exact percentage. Um, it's it's less than half, just under half. Okay, it's still yeah. quite significant. Yes. I had an idea it was less than that. Yes, because uh, I know eBay p pivoted very much to direct selling. Exactly. Um, yes. and, and I'd be surprised if it's half of their business now. Uh, no, it's it's definitely less than half. Yeah, yeah. yeah. for eBay for sure. Yeah. yeah, interesting. eBay never officially launched in this country, did it? No, they no. they bought Gumtree, um, and but oh, they've yeah. since sold it again. So okay. they don't seem to be that interested. But of course, the other some other big six pound. Six six hundred pound gorillas are interested. It seems. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about them just yeah. now. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, you, you say you, you're taking a decentralized approach to uh, to this. What, what do you mean by that, and how does that differ from the rest of the market? Yes. So that is another important point of differentiation for us. Um, typically, uh, for the most part, you'll see the marketplaces in South Africa, the current ones, and internationally, they would operate out of a centralized distribution center. So, for example. Yeah. If you take the, the, the big blue company mm -hmm. in South Africa, they would have a, a large DC in Cape Town and in Johannesburg. And um, as a seller, if you want to sell on the marketplace, you either have to keep store your goods in, the, in that DC and you pay a fee for the storage, or um, you can sell uh, where if a, if a sale takes place, you have to commit to, to, to get the goods to that DC within a period of time, and then it will get on delivered to the buyer from there. That is what I would consider more the centralized model. So we intend to um, champion, and this is where our strength from New Africa comes from to be able to do this, the more decentralized model where it will go directly from the seller to the, to the buyer without having to do the two hops. It just does the one hop. Oh. We believe we can uh, make that more efficient okay. um, from a speed and a cost point of view for the sellers. Now, if I'm a merchant selling widgets and I want to... I want to sign up for this process. What's actually for this uh, platform, Bob Group? What what, mm. what what's involved? What do I need to? So uh, the easiest way to mm. sign up would be is if you have an existing store already, because what we do is we have tools that allow you to synchronize. It's actually called Bob Sync. It's a it's a, a new product that we've launched that allows you to um, automatically sync your products from your store directly onto the marketplace. Because one of the challenges you have when you're selling across multiple platforms is to keep your inventory up to, start, up, right. up to, up, up to date. So yeah. for, you could sell, have one left in stock and then you could sell it on one platform and then someone buys it on another and then you, you're left with, without being able to fulfill it. So uh, this um, Bob Sync platform, what it does is it keeps your inventory automatically up to date. So if you get a sale on one of your channels, it automatically updates it on the other. 
And that's kind of like set and forget. So once you set that up, we have these tools, you just um, have to activate it, and then it automatically keeps your sales channels in sync. And so that's, that's the easiest way. But of course we have, you can do it as a spreadsheet. You can, if you put it in the right format, you can bulk upload, mm -hmm. or you can just use a web interface to upload um, products. Um, a lot of these marketplaces have uh, more of a cataloging based mm -hmm. system, whereas ours is a little bit more open from that perspective. So you don't actually have to link it to uh, an existing SKU. You can just load it up. There's, it's a, it's a friction to, to get going is, is, is lower. We, we, we. I remember 15 or 20 years ago when e-commerce was starting to take off, particularly B2B e-commerce, everyone was talking about XML as being the solution to, to everything in e-commerce and do, do a lot of what you've been talking about now. Is XML still a thing or? A um, it, it, the, it the concept is still else? the same, so it's, yeah. it's now would be JSON. So okay. Jason's J S O N. So that's right. that's a that's a it's a more um, robust format for exchange of data between mm -hmm. two, two different computers. Um, and so it's, the concept is the same, but it's moved on from from, moved on from to okay. Jason. Yeah. I don't know where I dragged that up from. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just remembered it now. Writing all about extensible markup language yes. back in the early two thousands. <laughs> okay, great. And uh, and this platform I believe is built all on top of AWS, right? Yes, so, so all of our infrastructure is hosted on AWS. Um, it's, we, we believe um, it's the best tool for the job for what we're doing. It, yep. it gives us great uh, you know, scalability, um, and it's come a long way from the early days when we used to spend a lot of time in the data center ourselves trying to replace you know, damaged hard drives or whatever the right. case. Now we just uh, can sit on a computer and click a few buttons, and, and even if come Black Friday, we can set auto-scaling rules. And right. th that, that part of the business has changed so much in mm. the last two decades from, from what we used to experience before. Yeah, All right. it wasn't that long ago when I remember Black Friday deals with crashing websites, but it doesn't seem to happen anymore. Yeah, mm. so it's, so you could also throw a lot of uh, money and hardware at it, and it could still crash. So we, you need both that and a, and a good uh, development team that makes right. sure that it doesn't do things it's not supposed yeah. to. Yeah. yeah, what are you expecting from Black Friday this year? Um, I think uh, more of the same. I mean, I mean, yeah. Uh, I mean, one of the challenges of Black Friday, I think, is uh, as a as a from us as a business, is that so many people have now jumped on the bandwagon. And uh, for example, if you want to get um, voice in the market, it's very expensive. Mm. So, so from our perspective, we we don't necessarily expect to. We're not planning on going. We, we, we've got a number of campaigns planned, and we, we, we we're going to do some exciting things. We believe, but probably less on the traditional front because I think even now with the the offline retailers jumping onto Black Friday, yeah. it's uh, become so noisy. You Very know, noisy. To, it's, yeah. um, I think we can do more, better things outside of, um, without jumping onto that bank, band, bandwagon as much. Yeah, yeah, interesting, yeah. interesting. So if, if people want to find out more about Bob Group, what's your website? Bob.ca.za. Bob.co.za. Did you had you registered that already? Or? No, I had to do some of my you know backdoor negotiations with someone who had had the domain squatter that had that domain. Okay, okay. <laughs> Hopefully, you didn't pay too much for it. Not too much. No, but yeah. I've, I've had a fair bit of experience in my in my career of negotiating buying yeah. domains. So yeah, so yeah. I put that to good work. Great, <laughs> Andy. Before I let you go, I have to ask you about the uh, the uh, elephant in the room, and oh. that's. That's of course the rumors. It's nothing's been confirmed yet. Rumors, but but it, it appears it's coming, and that's the launch of, of an Amazon marketplace in South Africa, mm. which is going to obviously compete head on with Naspash and Take a Lot, and of course we've got Walmart in this country as well, which is now buying out what it didn't already own in Massmart, and has already said that e-commerce is going to be a big focus for them in this market. And we know that that Walmart is a big player in e-commerce in the U.S. and is is competing head on with Amazon there. Um, what is what do you make of all this? What what mm. is it? What is the importance of it? What's going to happen? Super interesting. Um, I think another good example to relate to is what happened in, in India, where Amazon came in and and Walmart bought the the uh, incumbent there called uh, Flipkart from Nasbash. Uh, yes, was a big one of the shareholders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, I think I, I guess you, uh, if you look at history, um, it, it, it's it's possibly likely that it, you know it, it might repeat itself. Mm. There's a I think they're still very much head to head in India at the moment with yeah. big battle. So I think the consumer is going to be the ultimate real winner out of this because you know the, they're going to be the, the the real beneficiary. Because in South Africa now you, you've got take a lot you can throw that, them in, and and we're throwing our hats in the ring as well. Yes. So it's going to be very interesting. Um, I, I think there will probably be some consolidation at some point as well. I um, think that, that what's happened in other markets. But if you look, so my personal view, um, just my opinion, if I've, I've tried to look, uh, we at least have the benefit of seeing what's happened in other markets because Amazon have come in, in in a number of markets already and launched the marketplace. So 
I, I would imagine you could learn uh, what they, the way they've approached entering those markets is likely to be similar to how they're going to launch here. And from what I can tell, it's not this big bang approach. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very slow. I mean, so they, they're very obviously not to be underestimated by any means. Sure. Um, and, and I th- but I think it's going to take quite a while to ramp up. So it's almost like this slow but moving machine. But once they get momentum, I think mm. it will take time, but they'll, they, they will definitely uh, will become a major force to be reckoned with. Um, likewise for, for Walmart as well, I think. So it's going to be interesting. I think for us, we're going to try and differentiate ourselves as the, as the smaller player. I think, we, and we believe we can be more agile and more adaptable. And we're going to take a, a bit of a different approach. So I think I mentioned the, de- the decentralized versus centralized approach on the logistics. Yep. Um, obviously, we have the auctions as well. Um, we're going to focus more like where Amazon would have, you would have heard them talk about the, 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 them aspiring to be the most customer centric company in the world. Mm. Um, we like that approach as well, and I think Takelot has also adopted uh, that sort of philosophy. But we actually believe um, there's a bit of an imbalance in the market where the, the, the buyers is actually, it's too much towards the, the buyer. And we want to focus on making the seller, the merchant, our, our hero, of, and really empowering them to do well so that they can then provide this excellent service to their customers. And I don't know if you've seen, but there's Competition Commission have released an interim report yes. on what they have suggested might be considered, um, you know, uh, abuse of dominant power in the market. No, get, no guesses who that was predominantly aimed at. And we think there is some truth in that, in that, um, you know, that it needs to be a fairer playing field. And we think that sellers, to some extent, can be discriminated against. And we want to treat treat sellers better basically mm-hmm. i don't know if you can see on the logo here um it took i didn't see this at first but if you turn your head a bit to the right um you might see that it actually hopefully you can see that it makes up a, a hand yes that's what i saw yeah. and that's very intentional from our side yeah. so we want to be that helping hand to the to the to the sellers and to the merchants and so we, we um have a number of ways where we believe we can actually ap- approach this e-commerce challenge in south africa differently and so we don't want you won't necessarily see us doing um, going head to head directly with with those the, the, the big guys. Yeah. It's, it's interesting though what you say about um, uh, sort of a slowly slowly approach. And certainly, MassMart's be, uh, Walmart's been in the market for some time. I think they bought Walmart uh, sorry MassMart about ten or twelve years ago now, um, and they've been slowly building up and they've actually been accelerating their e-commerce uh, uh, investments in the last few years. Uh, it looks like uh, Amazon is is do, taking a, a, an organic approach, investing in warehouse capacity coming in, starting to build themselves. I suppose they've, they know all the, logis- the logistics game backwards. Um, but it was a little surprising to me. Was it surprising to you that, uh, that they didn't come in and buy Take A Lot or one of the other players in the market? Um, I, I personally was not that surprised. I, I understand why many people would be. Um, I, I think maybe, I mean, NASA, I'm sure, has high expectations on this asset that they've created, which they've done a, it's a great job, right? Mm. Um, so I imagine if they had to look, do the analysis of the buy versus build from a pure financial point of view, it's probably not going to, the, the accountants are probably not going to look too favor, favorably on that would be my guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not that I'd, I really know though. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, it's going to be fascinating to see what happens and, and whether one of these big uh, global giants uh, decides at some point that they need to buy to, to gain scale, which is what mm. we saw in India. Yes. Uh, could the same thing happen here at some point, do you think? I think it's very possible, for sure. Um, I somehow have a, my gut feeling tells me that we're not going to necessarily play out that way though in South Africa. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly why, but that's just a, a okay. feeling I have. Um, I think they're going to come in and invest and grow organically is my gut feeling. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. It's going to be certainly be a fascinating time for e-commerce in, in the, in the f- next few years ahead. And I think we must get you back in the studio at some point, Andy, to, to look at uh, how things are unfolding and, and find out how Bob Group is doing. Um, but I thank you for joining us here today and all the best with your new venture. Thank you very much, Duncan. I appreciate it.